What's up, guys? Welcome back to the MMA Meeting. Let's talk the Weasel Podcast, where we talk all things MMA. Hope you guys are having an amazing day, man. I just made a history podcast channel for you guys that enjoyed the history segments. So if you guys are a fan of history, make sure to check that out. And on this history podcast, we only talk about the interesting stuff. So you can find the link in the pinned comment and also the description. It's going to be on the, the podcast apps next week. So I hope you guys enjoy. 2024 is starting off pretty good. I was featured on the official UFC 297 countdown video for timestamp. I was on 9 minutes and 28 seconds and 20 minutes and 22 seconds. Super surreal. Really stoked about that. I really don't have many words. You know, I've been putting work in for so many years. You know, at this point, it's approaching exactly 7 years since I started making MMA content. And it's awesome to see, you know, getting recognized for the work and people appreciating it throughout the years. In 2024, there's a lot brewing for this year, man. I got a lot of stuff on the books here. And uh, I don't want to say too much more. It's going to be very fun. I think you guys are going to enjoy it. And that countdown video was really well done as well. They did put in the brawl between Strickland and Drickus. Strickland is looking like he's in insane shape right now. There's pictures going around that he's like riding an eight pack. It's crazy. I've never seen Strickland in this good a shape before going into a fight. And Drickus, he's always in great shape. He put it pretty well. He said, you know, Strickland finally has abs. Good for him. You know, I've been fighting with abs my whole career. So he's finally caught up. But it's pretty different where you were not in your best physical shape and you became champ. What we're going to expect from a Strickland who's in this good of shape. You know what I'm saying? Can you imagine how good he's gotten now? How much better his cardio potentially is? How much of a faster pace can he put on his opponent? I'm expecting now, knowing how good of a shape Strickland is... If the fight goes into the later rounds, Drickus could be in some major trouble. And we might see a much faster Sean Strickland as well. It looks like what Drickus said to him has motivated Strickland to another level. That's what it seems like here, just with his hard work in the gym. But we still got to see how he's going to perform and where his mental state is at when the fight starts. Because he could be in the best shape he's ever been, but if he does not fight intelligently, it's not going to matter too much. And the UFC fight night wrapped up, headlined by Uncle Live and Walker. I did pretty good on the predictions. I got only one incorrect on the whole card, so that's 10 out of 11 correct on the card. And I did get a lot of them also perfectly, like with the method and what round and stuff. Like the main event, I'm pretty sure most people knew that Uncle Live was going to win. And in fact, there was a lot of huge favorites on this card. But I did pick the second round knockout I did pick Jim Miller to win by submission I did pick for Hera to catch Phil Haas and put him out for Reed Bashara to win by decision John Silva to knock out Weston Wilson in the first round the one I got incorrect was Nicholas Mata and Tom Nolan I thought Tom Nolan was going to get him and he was a big favor going into it as well but here's the thing about predictions the correlation between having good predictions for a fight and your fight knowledge the correlation is pretty weak between the two Anybody can get picks correct. And I think a great example of this would be like Dan Hardy. Dan Hardy knows a lot about the sport. He has an incredible amount of knowledge on fighting in general. But he's known to have very bad predictions. And that's a perfect example of how the correlation between good predictions and good fight knowledge is pretty weak. Right? Guys who know a lot about the sport can get picks wrong all the time. And the picks themselves are not what's important. It's more the breakdowns and the analysis of the fight than the actual pick itself. The pick, anybody can get that correct. It's the analysis of the fight. That's what's important there. And I know a lot of you guys understand this, but I do see a lot of new fans that don't understand this yet. And we've all been through that where we thought, oh, picking fights correct means that you know so much about this sport. But I thought the card was pretty good, man. I thought the prelims went pretty well. There was a lot of finishes throughout the card. The main event had a second round knockout with Uncle Live putting away Johnny Walker. Good stoppage, and we might now have the next title contender. Uncle I have definitely learned and improved from training with Sean Strickland. That's what I saw there. He was doing a lot of stuff that I mentioned in my breakdown of the fight that Sean Strickland did against Israel Adesanya. And the two have been training together. So Uncle I have picked some things from Strickland, it seems. And I'm expecting some stuff from Strickland that he picked up from Uncle Live. And I think it's mostly with the wrestling. You know, Strickland's takedown defense in the Drickus fight is probably going to be way better than ever before. Because not only is Uncle Live a good wrestler, but he's also very big as well. This guy's a real light heavyweight. So that's going to be very interesting. Specifically with Uncle Live, those shift feints to take away the leg kicks from the longer opponent who doesn't do as well with pressure, that was perfectly used in this fight with Johnny Walker. And I'm very curious to see how his fight with Alex Pereira is going to go down if that fight gets put together. There is the presence of Jamal Hill still there. You know, he never lost his belt. He was a champ. He vacated it. We have to respect him for that. Who knows who's going to get the title shot at this point? It could be either guy, but it's going to be pretty interesting. I think Jamal Hill and Alex Pereira is going to be a much more competitive fight, and I think it's a better fight for Pereira. 
mainly for the fact that Jamal Hill is not going to shoot takedowns. Right, If you don't shoot takedowns on Alex Pereira, he doesn't have to worry about it as much. The threat of it is still going to be there because it's still an MMA fight and anything can happen. But he doesn't have to worry about it as much against Jamal Hill like he would against Uncle Liev. Even with Uncle Liev saying that he's not going to shoot takedowns, he's going to shoot takedowns, man. Jan Blachowicz said the same thing. I'm not going to shoot any takedowns. And he shot like 10 seconds into the fight. Yuri Prohaska said he wants to test himself on the feet with Pereira, which he did, but he did eventually shoot a takedown. Uncle Ive has better wrestling than those two other guys. And he's saying the same thing. I do expect him to shoot at some point in the fight, but Uncle Ive does have a knack for trying to test himself against the opponent's strengths. Like he did with Johnny Walker. He didn't shoot a takedown here. He grappled with Paul Craig. He struck a lot more with Jan Blachowicz. He's shown throughout his fights that he has this ego where he wants to test himself against where the opponent is strongest. And I think that could be a big mistake if he goes that same direction with Alex Pereira in the stand-up. This is not just some other striker. This is not a Johnny Walker. This is not a Jan Blachowicz. He is a specialist. To test yourself in the stand-up with a striking specialist is a different game you're playing, man. No, that doesn't throw out everything about Uncle Live's success in the stand-up. He can find some good shots. He is a big guy who can knock you out with one single strike. And we saw that Alex Pereira doesn't do as well against Southpaws who are blitzing him down. But the thing is, Uncle Live doesn't usually like to blitz you down. He's more of a counter-striker. Even shown in this Johnny Walker fight. He's a lot more vulnerable when he's moving forward himself, being aggressive with his own striking and trying to open them up forcefully. There is where I think Alex Pereira can absolutely find some big counter punch to put Uncle Ive down. If Uncle Ive goes out there and wrestles, I think he should win the fight. And I believe a lot of people know this as well. He is the best wrestler probably in the whole top 15. Not so much of a submission game. I'm pretty sure he has submissions in his arsenal, but he just usually doesn't go that direction. With Pereira, I think there could be opportunities for him to find some submissions here and there. He's got his back taken already in the UFC. But I'm guessing that Uncle Live is going to try to beat him through ground and pound instead of submitting him. Jim Miller with that fantastic submission win over Gabriel Benitez landed some very good left hands and didn't allow him to get away with those leg kicks. So he was answering the leg kicks constantly with his own. And Jim Miller's got some very good low kicks, man. It's a great win for him to get to UFC 300 because I don't think he took enough damage. Wait, they just announced it. Jim Miller is fighting Bobby Green on UFC 300. So it's not going to be Paul Felder. I like the fight for Jim Miller because Bobby Green's another veteran and they've never fought each other, which is very crazy. These two guys have like the most fights in the lightweight division and never fought each other, but they did get scheduled three times, I believe, and it never took place. Finally, they get to meet at the grand stage of UFC 300. I'm super excited about it, but the only thing about Bobby Green is I don't know if he should return that quickly. The knockout loss to Jalen Turner was horrible, man. I don't expect him to return with a clear head. The ref let it go for so long. I don't see how Bobby Green didn't suffer any kind of severe brain damage. And Jim Miller could potentially catch him with something big in this fight and get that win. Even though Bobby Green's a way better boxer, if Jim Miller lands one big shot, I think Bobby Green can go down and then potentially gets knocked out or submitted afterward. But I do like it on paper that Jim Miller and Bobby Green will finally fight each other. I think that I think that's a great storyline. Oh, Max Holloway and Justin Gaethje is on the card, as we all expected. But back on this fight night card, there was a lot of fighters that stood out. Joshua Van looked really good. John Silva delivered as well as expected against his opponent, Wilson. Mario Batista had a very good performance. That was a good fight with Ricky Simone. Bruno Ferreira did get that big knockout, but the guy that really stood out for me was Marcus McGee. I expected great things out of Marcus McGee, and he delivered way beyond expectations. I thought the fight with Bolaños was going to be kind of competitive because Blanio is not a bad striker at all. But McGee's shot placement it was so on point. His footwork was good. His power was steady the whole time. That short right hook after the, the combination off the high kick was beautiful stuff, man. I love the way his punches are so in tight like that. Not a lot of motion. And he's able to hurt you with every single one of those punches. He doesn't need to wind up and swing big to hurt his opponent. And that's when you know the guy has good boxing. Marcus McGee is going to do amazing things in this bantamweight division. He's one of the more promising prospects of the bantamweight division right now. And now let's get into the news about Justin Gaethje versus Max Holloway for the BMF title. So there is a potential to have, I guess, like four title fights if you come to BMF. At least three for sure, because it's no way Zhang Wei Li versus Yang Zhao Nan headlines the card. And my prediction on Twitter, or X, seems to be coming true of how the fight card is laying out. So I had Alex Pereira headlining the card against somebody. Leon versus Bilal 2 as the co-main event. Justin Gaethje versus Max Holloway. And maybe Yuri 
versus Rock Hitch is on the main card or it's going to headline the prelims. And of course, we all knew Jim Miller was going to be on it. And I still see that right now. I think Pereira might be headlining the card because there's no way you can headline with Leon versus Blal. Now, with Justin and Max, I'm scared for Max in this fight. He's probably going to get hurt out there. He's a very good tactician. He's technical. He has a very good offensive game. And Justin could let him work a little bit in the first round because Justin these days doesn't really put the pressure on you like he used to. So there is a way for Max to build on his momentum and overwhelm Justin Gaethje. But if you want the normie take of this, it's Justin definitely hits harder than Dustin. So every single shot can definitely hurt him. Max has taken a lot of damage ever since the Dustin fight. So his chin at least could be a little bit softer going into this. And Justin's got big leg kicks that Max doesn't deal with too well, which can point to a first time knockout loss or at least TKO loss of Max Holloway's career. If there's anybody at this point that can finish Max Holloway with strikes, it's Justin Gaethje right now. The thing about the light kicks are, it's not just the damage from those, but it sets up the punches too. And it could also condition for high kicks, right? Max is a tall guy for the featherweight division, so not a lot of guys are going to be able to head kick him the way like Yair Rodriguez could, because Yair is the same height as him. They're 5'11". But there's a lot of guys in the featherweight division that are like 5'6", 5'7", 5'8", that might not be able to throw a high kick as easily as someone like Max, because sometimes he'll stand a bit taller. Justin doesn't have to worry about that, so he can condition the light kicks into high kicks very well in this. He can hide his right hand to deliver with the high kick as well. Every single punch is going to be damaging. All the punches are going to have the purpose of hurting Max, and Justin could do it moving forward and backwards. Dustin could do that too, right? Dustin has a very good check right hook that he hurt Michael Chandler with, but the way that Justin gets to a sudden stop and explodes out there like a bowl off the right hand and then falls up with the left hook, kind of similar to what he did to Tony Ferguson, and he can even catch you with big uppercuts if you want to change levels on him for body shots, and we do know that Max will want to target the body against Justin, so if Justin could time the level changes as Max is ducking in for the body right straight, he could catch him with that uppercut that he was landing on Rafael Fazeev throughout the fight that he dropped Michael Chandler with, so we do know that Justin has a very good right uppercut. Justin has always had this power with him, but the most dangerous thing about Justin now compared to before is how good his timing is and how composed he has gotten. Combining that with the power, Max could be in a lot of trouble in this fight, man. But it is for the BMF title, and Max is trying to show himself to be the baddest man in the UFC by taking this kind of fight. He should be at a disadvantage. He didn't deal well with the power last time. He's probably not going to deal with it that well this time against a more powerful guy. Now, here's the thing. What happens with the winner of this fight, that's very interesting to think about because Islam is most likely going to fight in the summer or they're going to wait him out for the Abu Dhabi card later in the year. And why they might hold him out until the end of the year instead of putting him in the summer is because of a lack of an opponent for the summer. Charles Oliveira and Armin, Justin and Max are all fighting on the same card in April. Will they have enough time to prepare themselves for a fight with Islam in June? That's a two-month turnaround, and they have to go back into training camp right after the fight, and I cannot imagine these four guys get out of their fights unscathed. Max may not get a title shot. He might get the, the featherweight title shot after this if he beats Justin Gaethje, because the winner of Charles Oliveira and Armin, I think, would deserve a title shot over if Max beats Justin. But that's the thing, though. I don't see any of these guys coming out of their fights undamaged. Even Justin Gaethje. Charles is probably going to get knocked down. Armin's probably going to get hurt. I see Justin taking a bunch of shots before he wins. Max might get finished. And if he doesn't, he's probably going to take the most damage out of these four guys. I don't see how they're going to be ready to fight Islam in the summer. And if those four are not going to fight him, then what do you do with Islam Makashev? You know what they might be doing? Islam versus Leon at 170. Wait a second. The June card is in Saudi Arabia, and they need to put a big fight over there because Saudi Arabia was not happy with the March date. So they moved it to June in order to stack it better, and it's pulling the cards for Islam versus Leon, potentially, because that would sell out that card. That would sell out the arena. That would make the higher-ups over there in Saudi Arabia happy. Wait a second. No way. No way. Is that the fight that's happening? Are they going to bail on Bilal Muhammad? And they have like Bilal versus Shavka on the same card? Saudi Arabia may have just changed the fight for Islam and Leon. I think Islam should fight the winner of Charles and Armin next. And I think Leon should fight Bilal. But I'm starting to think this is the direction they're going with the circumstances. Because there's no lightweight contender that's going to be ready for June. There's no way. At least a lightweight contender that's earned their shot at the title. And that card will be so huge. It's most likely going to be in the middle of the day. Something similar to what happened with uh, Nganu versus Tyson Fury. Just thankfully it's the UFC. So it's not going to be crazy commercials and a runtime that's too long. We're going to get fights pretty quickly. 
So we might see the main event happen in the middle of the afternoon. But now let's think, if it's not Islam versus Leon, then what do you do with that card? Who headlines it? It's in Saudi Arabia, they're gonna want someone like Islam. Could they have Tom Aspinall over there? But then who would he fight? Is that the date where Alex Pereira potentially goes for the double title defense? They could also put on Hamza Shemaev versus Israel Adesanya on that card too. Or if Jared Kananir is able to come back by June, you could do Hamza versus Kananir there. If Jamal Hill is not ready, they might have Pereira versus Magomed Ankolaev on that card. I don't even know at this point. I I'm thinking it's Leon versus Islam. That's what I'm really thinking here, even though I don't think that should be the fight, because it's kind of dirty to some of these contenders that have earned their shot or will earn their shot after 300. You could make the argument, though, that if Islam fights Leon on the June card, they can still fight later down the road in October because the lightweight belt is not going to be on the line against Leon. Wow, that's actually very interesting. And then what do you do with Connor versus Chandler? Because Connor was saying that he's going to fight Chandler in June because of the move of the Saudi Arabian card. Are they going to have two pay-per-views for June? Because sometimes they do that. They do it a lot more with July, but this time they might move it to June with two pay-per-view cards. One at the end of the month and then one in the beginning of the month. So they can have both Islam and Connor headlining cards in the same month, which would be enormous for the UFC. If we go back down memory lane, when do you think light heavyweight was at its best? I was thinking about this the other day. I think light heavyweight is pretty fun right now with Pereira on top, Yuri Prohaska, Magomed Ankolaev doing great things right now. Jamal Hill is out there. Nikita Krylov is better than he's ever been. I think 2015 was when 205 was at its peak with talent. You had the four titans in their primes at that time. John Jones, Daniel Cormier, Alexander Gustafson, and Anthony Rumble Johnson. They were all at their very best. I guess you can argue that DC was a better heavyweight than he was a light heavyweight. You could put an argument for that, or he got better later. Because his performance against John Jones in the rematch, it looked like he was better in that fight. Even though he did get knocked out, he was performing pretty well up until that point. He got caught by Jones in a rematch. There's the narrative right now that Uncle Live is the wrong guy to accept rematches with. John Jones is like the preeminent rematch fighter. This was shown against DC and Gustafson. When a fighter is able to perform that much better in a rematch like that and get a greater result, it shows their intellect in the game. It shows their ability to make game plans and find their ways through different weaknesses and avoiding certain strengths about the opponent that both John Jones and someone like Magomed and Uncle Live have shown. Right, These two guys are very intelligent when it comes to understanding the opponent's game in a rematch. But John Jones seems to be the very best, the cream of the crop when it comes to taking a rematch and performing much better. And that was one of the best DC I've ever seen. Daniel Cormier was operating at such a high level in that fight, especially with his boxing. And we know how difficult John Jones can make it for his opponents to get in on him, right? He has that post and retreat, lingers with the lead arm and moves away from you. And he could keep you on the outside range for long durations of the fight. And DC found his way in. Being Jones' shortest opponent, some of it was like hand trapping with his power hand, making his body a lot more square, which was an issue for his body shots, right? John Jones was really lining up those body shots very well that Stipe eventually later brought into his game against DC as well. But reaching with his right hand was allowing him to get in closer on John Jones, leading a lot of his combinations with the left hook. But those half beat left hooks to the body from Jones were crazy good, man. Picking at DC, and DC was able to use his toughness in order to get through a lot of this, where other points probably would not be able to. You know, the pocket exchanges with DC were pretty good as well. It's just he fought a much smarter opponent. John Jones is so good, man. He's a light heavyweight slash heavyweight now that really stands out with his technique. The heavier guys do get knocked for a lot of their lack of technique. But John Jones is the guy that really stands out. And you had prime Gustafson and prime Rumble there as well. We know how Gustafson did against John Jones. We know how well he did against DC. Very close fights that, you know, just a few different exchanges. A couple different exchanges for Gustafson. And he would become the light heavyweight champ and have defeated both John Jones and DC. Just if a couple of those exchanges went a little bit differently. Gustafson would be the guy we're talking about right now. I mean, this is the same guy that absolutely annihilated Glover Teixeira. That fifth round combination to end that fight still goes down, in my opinion, as one of the greatest combinations in light heavyweight history. I have all the light heavyweights I could think of that put together a well-executed combination. Chuck Liddell's bombardment on Tito and Gus's slick combo on Glover really stand out. Gustafson's uppercuts into the left pivot fade out for the right hand was just absolutely insane to see someone pull that off, especially for a heavier guy. But he lost the rumble. Now, I don't know how... uh present it is anymore but I know back in those days some people were taking that win away from him because there was a potential headbutt there was a lot of controversy about a headbutt in there but we do have to also remember that Gustafson did poke Rumble in the eye right before that happened 
And it usually goes that way with Rumble in his fights. Rumble was the most eye poke prone fighter ever. He got poked in the eye by so many of his opponents. And then as soon as it happens, he clobbers them and they just flail around the octagon. Could you imagine if Rumble fought John Jones, how many times he would have gotten eye poked? And those two were supposed to fight each other. And man, when that fight got announced, it was such a compelling fight. I was so much looking forward to it. I think Jones would have won. I think he would have taken the fight to the ground and eventually submitted Rumble. Rumble didn't have a great Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu game, but he was so dangerous in the stand-up. He has such a sneaky left high kick that he would even throw up against taller opponents. His speed was impeccable. I mean, even Daniel Cormier, who was a very fast light heavyweight, he was saying that Rumble was just way too fast for him. He needed to really lock him down and tie him up so the explosive striking speed of Rumble is not going to be a problem there. And still to this day, I don't even know how DC took that, that head kick. He took the overhand right that sent him flying across the octagon. But then remember when he ate the head kick? He leaned into it as well. I think the knockout from John Jones and then the TKO from Stipe, I think takes away the, the aura that DC had back then. Because DC back then was known to have an insane chin. From his Gustafson fight, the amount of damage that he took there and still did not go away. He got hit hard by that knee. And against such a taller opponent, six foot five Gustafson, the knee is going to be way more dangerous. And then followed up with some big shots. And DC used to say back then that you can't put him away with one big shot. You have to follow it up, right? It's the follow-up shots that get to him. Because he gets hurt sometimes by a big shot. But he'll never go down until someone follows it up. And Gustafson did that. Gustafson followed up. But if you guys have never seen the DC and Rumble first fight, look at the time when Rumble hit him with the high kick, man. Still to this day, I don't know how he took it. This is Rumble we're talking about. 2014 to like 2016 was a different time. For the light heavyweight division. And I can only imagine if those guys were competing today with the light heavyweights we have. You know, no disrespect to Pereira, no disrespect to Jamal Hill and Yuri Prohaska and Malcolm and Uncle Laev, But I think the four titans of the 2015 205 division would have probably smoked all these guys today. And it definitely goes against the narrative that older fighters are not as good as the newer fighters. There are in some cases, especially with the heavier divisions, middleweight, light heavyweight, and heavyweight specifically, where there are some older fighters would do amazing things today. Can you imagine if Anderson Silva was in his prime right now in middleweight? Can you imagine Jones, DC, Gustafson, Rumble in their primes right now at 205? Can you imagine Cain Velasquez, Fedor, Prime JDS, potentially Alistair Overeem, what those guys would be able to do today at heavyweight? Most likely not become champ because... Uh, John Jones has the belt, but they would perform very well with the contenders right now. And speaking of heavyweights, apparently Joe Pfeiffer is getting a lot of this um, praise for his power. This was said on the Joe Rogan podcast that Joe Pfeiffer, a middleweight, punched a higher score than Francis Ngannou on the power cube. Now, firstly, I don't know how accurate that thing is. Ngannou did have the high score, but of course, not everybody punched it. So, you know, I'd love to see Deontay Wilder punch it and Anthony Joshua and some of these other guys. But regardless, I'm very curious to see how Joel Pfeiffer punched that thing because it's very hard to believe that he punched it harder than Ngannou did. In order for it to be legitimate, he had to have thrown the same punch as Ngannou right and got him through the right straight and the right uppercut i forgot which one had the high score and he was standing right in front of the machine he did not move he was not steps away from the machine and then ran up to it and hit it i'm curious to see if joe pfeiffer was like standing a few steps away from the machine before he threw his punch at it if you got a head start it's going to make your punch so much more powerful like for an example look at the way eddie hall punched it right he hit the power cube and he got pretty close to Nganu's record. Now, he's a massive guy, but he was standing way further away than Nganu was, and he was leaning all the way back before he threw it. Put all of his weight into the punch, and Joe Pfeiffer said he has a recording of it, so it's going to be interesting when he puts that out there. Now, the thing about the power cube and throwing your hardest punch at it, it doesn't translate to fighting too much, because even though if you swing back a big punch at the power cube machine, it's going to generate higher numbers, but in a fight... These punches sometimes do not have the same kind of impact. It's because the opponent is moving a certain way. It's because of the anatomy of the human body. Precision, in my opinion, is way more important than real power to get a knockout. This is why sometimes you see someone throw some big winging punch and they don't knock out the opponent, but then you're able to put them down with a very quick straight or a left hook or a jab even. But you're throwing these haymakers at them in the same fight, but was not able to put them down with it. You put them down with a short, quick punch instead. This is why the power cube is not 
too important. Knockdowns and knockouts aren't always about power. A jab can knock down the opponent and present quote-unquote more power than an overhand or something like that. It's because the power itself in the punch is not nearly as important as it is for punching a machine that doesn't move, the target is there, you know. If the opponent is standing there, then yes, it is going to be true. But fighters just don't stand there to take hits like that. The amount of power gain taken away from a punch when you just simply roll your head with it, I think it's very much... um understated in sports for an example if i threw a big right hook and you move your head with the punch that would probably inflict less damage than me if i hit you with a jab square on even though i put way more power and weight into this right hook it's gonna be weaker than if i hit you with a very clean jab that you did not move your head from and with that let's go right to the questions we're gonna start with mike Hey Weasel, love the content. Have you seen Islam's new tweet about wanting to defend against Gaethje in June, then fight the winner of Armin and Oliveira at Madison Square Garden in November? Seeing that tweet, I feel sorry for the man because his MSG dream is probably never going to happen. Yeah, it's exactly what I was thinking too. That got me thinking that Islam's chances to connect with the Western fans is being robbed from him. That's a very good point. There's so many places that Islam could fight and gain more fans. Canada, MSG, Miami, T-Mobile, Salt Lake. But the UFC and the Abu Dhabi guys are desperate to save him for the Abu Dhabi card every single year. And it's really annoying. I know Dana has announced that Islam is injured and will fight in the summer. But I'm worried that it's going to be pushed back to October anyway. What's your take on it though? Also, for the life of me, why is the man who got knocked out brutally at UFC 294 in Volk defending his belt at least 4 months before the winner in Islam who took literally no damage in the fight. Either the UFC has bad management, Volk's got a literal death wish and hates himself, or Volk is extremely delusional about his own capabilities. This is a great question, man. And something I didn't really think about too much. In a way, Islam is kind of being robbed from expanding himself to the Western fans. Now, regardless, we got pay-per-view, so they're going to watch it, but it'd be really cool for him to defend his belt in the United States, and he wants to fight in Madison Square Garden, but... We know that's probably not going to happen. We know he's most likely going to fight in Abu Dhabi in the fourth quarter every single year. It isn't just Islam that gets this kind of treatment, but it seems like they shelve him a lot so he can fight in the Middle East. Business-wise, you can't fault a business for doing that, you know, because they probably make a lot of money for him to fight over there. And the fact that MSG is usually in November, the chances of Islam fighting there is very, very low. And I saw his post as well. He wants to fight in June and then wants to fight in November. But I don't know what this whole thing about him being injured is. There's videos of him doing stuff, physical activities, exercising, and all this stuff. And the potential star power of Islam Makashev is being kind of uh, shortened here. He's a fun fighter to watch. He finishes most of his opponents. He's a great striker. He's a great grappler. He's a great representative of what an MMA fighter is. Guys like him, guys like Volkanovski, guys like John Jones, you know, in the cage. These guys show the evolution of an MMA fighter, what they should be looking like. In the future, someone's going to take that representation for themselves, you know, as the sport evolves. And it's crazy that whole thing is getting taken away from so many Western fans to witness in person. And you could potentially broaden out his fan base, right? Broaden out his star power to be much more globally than just one area of the world. And this goes true for every fighter. Any fighter who has any kind of star power, it'd be awesome to see them get spread out globally than just focused in one area. But you do see this with a couple other fighters as well. Like for an example, GSP. Even though he fought in different arenas, he fought at UFC 100. They mostly did save him for Canada. And John Jones usually does not fight internationally. He's usually only in the United States fighting in Las Vegas or Madison Square Garden. He's very much US bound. But then you look at what they're doing with Zhang Wei Li, right? Zhang Wei Li is fighting a lot in the West. She's fought in China, but as a champion, she's mostly in the US. So with her, it looks like the plan is to broaden out her star power. And then eventually she comes home to China for a massive event. And in terms of like your second question about Volkanovski taking the fight around four months later, but Islam, the guy who took no damage in the fight, He's out for some time. Now, I don't know how injured he is, but, you know, stemming from some of the videos that he was posting out, he doesn't look too injured. But then again, he didn't say anything about his injury. He was saying that he wanted to fight in March, and now he says he wants to fight in June and also in November. It seems like his plan was to fight three times this year. March, June, November. But it looks like we might only see him twice this year, in the summer, and then probably in October for Abu Dhabi. And Volk may be delusional of his capabilities. That can absolutely be true, because most fighters are. And if you're at the highest level, your delusion about yourself is probably at an all-time high. This is not just for Volk, this is for every fighter who wants to do amazing things in the sport. You absolutely have to be delusional about yourself. You have to think of yourself as the best fighter that's ever stepped foot on this planet. And what could come with that is, I could fight in three months, I could fight in four months after getting knocked out, of course I can, I'm the best. I gotta believe in myself. And a lot of the times, these guys wanna get that taste out of their mouth. They wanna get back in the wind column. Imagine getting knocked out like that in the first round, and you're still a champion. 
You still hold the belt. You're still the king of the 45 division. But your very last fight was a bad knockout loss. You've never lost like this in the UFC on a grand stage like that too. And you're living with that for months, right? I don't even fault Volkanovski too much, like mentally trying to get that loss out of his mind, especially with how competitive this guy is. Volkanovski is an extreme competitor. This guy was willing to take up a title fight at 55, coming off surgery against one of the best fighters in the world. He wants to take that up on short notice. That's how competitive this guy is. But that's what I think the managers and the coaches have to bring you back to reality. He took the fight. He has to compete now. He has no other choice but to show up on fight night. And it could be a mistake or it could not be. The fight with Ilya Tapuria is going to answer a lot of questions, not only about Volkanovski, but for all different kind of fighters who want to take up fights with quick turnarounds off of knockout losses, Volkanovski is putting everything at stake under such circumstances that he himself is doing. He is putting himself in the situation. Nobody told him to take the Islam fight on short notice. They had the backup fighter with Gamrot. Nobody told him, you have to do it. He was offered, and he accepted. Then, he wanted to fight in February. In fact, if I remember correctly, didn't he want to fight in January? But they gave him February instead. And he's like, all right, yes, I'll fight in February. I'll fight the undefeated knockout artist Ilya Tapuria with a great ground game. Young guy with all the momentum behind him, all the confidence, and is coming out there to take your head off and wear the crown. It's very ballsy of him, like very brave of Volkanovski. But is it worth it? That's the thing here. Is it worth it? At his age too? We're going to see, man. They're going to Richard Connolly. Hey, Weasel, got a few questions. Number one, how would you see Habib doing if Damian Maya got his back in a fight and got his hooks in? It's hard to say because he's never been put in that situation in his prime in the UFC. But the fact that Damian Maya is much bigger than Habib, he's one of the best back takers in the sports history. I think Habib would have to ride that out to the end of the round. And I think he could do it. I think his, this is not based off any kind of real evidence. But I would guess he would be able to defend the choke from finishing him. Just like Hori Mazadal did, for an example. Right? If Hori can do it, I'm pretty confident Habib can do it as well. Number two, with Cejudo criticizing Volk for showing his emotions post-fight UFC 294, do you think the press conference with them together could get heated? And do you see any potential argument or not? And with Ilya's trash talk, do you see any potential press conference moments or dynamics occurring? Yeah. Pseudo always wants to rough people's feathers and, you know, anybody around his weight class. The fact that he's talking about Volkanovski still means that he still wants to fight him, right? That triple champ status is still, I think, actually the only thing that's pushing Cejudo to keep fighting. Just the chance of getting the featherweight belt, I think, is the main thing that's keeping Cejudo fighting right now. But he needs to get that bantamweight belt in order to do so, right? Because if he went up to featherweight right now, they would not give him an immediate title fight. And I don't think he wants to take several fights in the featherweight division. He just wants one. And in order to go down that path, he needs the bantamweight belt first. So when he's talking about Volkanovski's emotions and how he should not be doing that stuff in front of the public, I can understand what he's saying. You know, sometimes you don't want to be too vulnerable. Express yourself, especially after getting knocked out like that. But at the same time, it, I think it's very good for a lot of fans to see that because it shows the realities of a fighter's mentality. Even someone as strong-minded as Volkanovski, he even gets emotional like that after a loss. He even breaks down like that. It humanizes Volkanovski and makes people love him even more for it. So I do disagree with Cejudo somewhat in criticizing Volk in that moment. This guy's at the pinnacle of a sport and he failed at something that he dreamt of doing, right? He failed at something that he got so close to achieving earlier in that year and knows that it got away from him. The chance of ever becoming a double champ is over for him forever and he knows that. And also getting knocked out in the same process. It wasn't just another loss. It was probably the worst way he could have lost. So yeah, it's very understandable for Volk to be emotional in that moment. And in the 298 press conference, Saudo was going to say a lot of stuff about Volk. Ilya might say some stuff about Volk as well. When they had that seasonal press conference with Strickland and Drickus and all of them, Ilya didn't have as much to say. I think because Strickland and Drickus took over the show, right? Strickland was talking a lot. There wasn't as much room for Tapuria to get some words in there, but at 298... He is the headliner. Him and Volk are the main attraction of the show, and they're going to be asked questions more than anybody else. So I'm definitely expecting way more trash talk from Tapuria in this press conference. And we'll see if he can get in Volkanovski's head, because I think Volkanovski is going to be the target of the trash talk more than anybody else up there, from both Sahudo and from Ilya Tapuria. Then your third question, if St. Denis beats Poirier and gets to fight Islam, 
Do you think it'd be way too much, way too soon for him? And do you think St. Denis' style would work well against Islam or badly? We love the hard work you keep putting in, bro. Thank you so much, man. I don't think St. Denis is completely out of this fight. It's crazy that he's the favorite in some of these odds. That I don't agree with at all. Dustin should be the favorite. That's not to take away St. Denis' power. That's not to take away his grappling technique. He has good wrestling. He has the open stance for the high kicks. He's a big, long guy that could work with a lot of stuff here. But let's say he beats... Poirier. How would he do against Islam? I think he has a better style against Islam than he does against a dangerous striker with good takedown defense. Against Islam specifically, he could work off of that long jab. He could work on defending the takedowns. Again, he's a very big guy and I'm expecting some good takedown defense out of him. Making the fight as chaotic as possible with his aggressive approach against Islam could make him fall into some big counter shots. Islam is quite good at finding his shots on the back foot, but St. Denis is a tank, right? If he can take that big shot and keep going, like it doesn't deter him, it doesn't knock him off balance, and he's able to take the punch and deliver with some massive left hand or something, that could give Islam some trouble here. Islam has not fought some super durable guy yet at the highest level. I think not necessarily St. Denis' skills overall, I think his durability, size, combine that with his aggression, is the biggest difficult thing for Islam to get through. Because it's going to be the first guy where Islam can hit and he doesn't go away. There's a potential of that there. Unless Islam is that precise with his shot and becomes the first guy to put St. Denis down by sniping him with that single counter punch. As of right now, I don't see it because of how durable St. Denis is. And I wonder what happens to Islam once he counters St. Denis, but St. Denis tanks it and throws some big punch right behind it. Will Islam be ready for it? He could potentially shoot under for a takedown. He could potentially move away, fade out from there. That's what I'm looking forward to when it comes to St. Denis' style. Then we go to Nana Oho. Hey, Weasel, love your content. Sounds weird, but do you think at one point Islam took PEDs? He did pop for the same thing the Olympic team did. Dana's saying he is injured, but in Instagram, he's doing exercises. And then you have a second question. So regarding Islam taking PEDs, I would never doubt any fighter taking PEDs ever. He did pop for something a long time ago. They do say it was like medication and stuff, kind of similar with the whole thing with Usman or Megamadoff. I'm not going to accuse anybody of purposely taking PEDs without evidence. I think it's very unfair for these fighters, and it's a, it's a big accusation against them. And then your second question, what happened to Colby on his fight with Leon? What if the switching of stands... And preview of Mazadel versus Diaz boxing. What happened with Colby with Leon? Um, I think it came out that he injured his foot in the first round, which could explain a lot of the lack of aggression from him. If we do remember in the second Usman fight, Colby was also not aggressive for the first round. So it looked like maybe he was going that same direction, but then he didn't try until it was way too late. When you're down like two, three rounds, you got to go, man. Injured or not, you, this is your opportunity. You're in there. There's no redos. This is, you got to work with what you got. If you're injured, you got to fight through it. Remember when Uriah Faber fought Mike Brown with two injured hands and he started throwing elbows? You got to work with what you got. And it seemed like Colby, he just didn't want to get knocked out. And he'd rather take this other route where he can kind of still play the character and say how he was robbed and stuff like that. You can't say you're robbed and you can't play the character if you get knocked out. So he played it safe. And I think a lot, so that's one aspect. I think he also was a bit ring rusted. He definitely looked like it, not only in his striking, but also his wrestling was a lot sloppier than before. And also Leon's distance game messed up Colby Covington and how to find that entry. But at the same time, you have to just go. Colby had to make his entry. If he can't find it, if Leon's not giving it to him, force his way into the wrestling. And actually, when he did that, he had success. When he went after Leon and just rushed him, he was having way more success doing that. And the preview of Mazadel versus Diaz, I don't know exactly what you mean by your question of um, what it the switching of stands. Um, but regarding the preview of Mazadel and Diaz, I think Mazadel is going to absolutely win this. He's been out for a little bit, but it could be good time off against an older opponent. If he fought some young guy, the time off that he took would be horrible for him. But the fact that his opponent's Nate Diaz, who really did not look good at all against Jake Paul, I think this should be a good win for Mazadel. Diaz's punching form has like degraded so much. He slaps a lot, especially with big gloves on his hands. Like, look at the difference with how he was throwing punches against Michael Johnson. And then look at how he was throwing punches against Jake Paul. He's not even the same guy. Whereas Mazadel still kind of packs that kind of power. He was destroying Diaz when they fought each other in MMA. And Diaz doesn't necessarily have the kind of power, I think, to knock Mazadel out like Kamar Usman could. Then we go to Mike Griffith. Question, what's up with your guy Putrion? Why does he keep losing all these fights? He's not supposed to be losing. It makes no sense. A guy like him should be running through all these guys. His boxing is fantastic. He's one of the best body kickers. His ground game is great. His head movement is on point, never runs out of energy. He trained with Habib and trained with Mazadel. The guy is way too perfect. What's going on here? I don't know, maybe he doesn't have the passion anymore. His biggest weakness got exposed by Aljamain Sterling and Marab Davalashvili. He's an incredibly slow starter. 
And everybody knows at this point to just go after him right from the beginning of the fight. And he it takes away his ability to download data. So not only are you attacking his weak point, but you're also taking his strength away from him as well. Pierre Chiyan does an amazing job of downloading data throughout the fight. That's his best asset. Out of everything that he does, like his boxing's great, his kicks are great, ground game's great, defense is great. Everything is great about him, technically speaking. But he's able to put that together when he downloads data. If the fight is slow enough at his pace... He does better as the rounds go on, usually. The Sean O'Malley fight didn't play out exactly that way, but it shows how great Sean O'Malley is as a striker to able to keep up and even win exchanges against Pietro Jan in the later rounds. But the style of Pietro Jan is to gradually get better as the fight plays out as he's picking apart information from the opponent. He downloads the data of his opponent so well that he becomes almost impossible to beat in the fifth round if you do not overwhelm him early. So... By overwhelming Pietro Jan early, you take away his ability to download data. Now he gets put on the defense right from the beginning of the fight and he can never get out of first gear. There's so much data getting thrown at him, he can't download it in time or he can't understand exactly what's happening in the fight in time. And before he knows it, the fight's over. Like when he fought Marab Davalashvili, he looked not that different from the first and fifth rounds. And that's very crazy to think about for Pietro Jan. When you look at his Corey Sanhagen fight, for an example. First round against Corey was a worse version of Pietrian than what he looked like in the fifth round. Fifth round Pietrian in that fight was way better than first round Pietrian in that fight. Because he understood exactly what to do against Corey Sanhagen as the fight was playing out. So it's not necessarily just like his individual martial art technique. It's more of the pace that he fights at. Then your second question, I'm not sure if you saw Ilya Tapuria going back and forth on Twitter with Conor McGregor, and I saw a few fans getting excited talking about maybe Tapuria could do what Volk did in the future and go to 155 and fight Conor. Can you please bring these people to reality and let them know that a fight between Conor and Tapuria would be a complete mismatch, and that Tapuria would absolutely destroy Conor, and this is coming from a Conor fan, I love Conor, but he's not touching Tapuria. Do we agree on that? Your thoughts. If they fought 155, Ilya wins for sure. The size of Connor and the few techniques that he can work with because of some of Ilya's weaknesses would make me believe that it's not going to be a complete mismatch. We saw what Jai Herbert was able to do against Tapuria. And it looks like, you know, Tapuria's a real 145er. He is not a 155er at all. He's like 5'7". He has the same build as a lot of 145ers. And Connor could do some good things against Tapuria, but I think right now... Yeah, Tapuria would win. Not only does he have the boxing to go to, but he could try to take Connor to the ground. And the worst part of it all is not necessarily the first and second rounds, where I think Connor could work with some good things here. I think he has some good high kicks against Tapuria, who seems to have a little bit of a high kick weakness. But as soon as that fight goes into the third round, I think Tapuria, I think Connor is going to start gassing out with that pace. I think Tapuria will get right on the inside and land some big shots. Connor is not going to be able to pocket box with Tapuria. I don't think he's going to be able to grapple with him. And that fight would probably get finished in the third or fourth rounds. And then we go to the public questions. We're going to start with Poe Honeypot with the most likes. At this point, is it actually damaging to John's legacy to wait so long to fight an aged and ring-rusted Stipe? And do you think it's unfair to Aspinall end the division? No, it will not damage John Jones' legacy unless like he does horribly in the fight. If that fight even becomes competitive, it will probably take a blow to John Jones. But let's say if he does what everybody expects, he blows right through Stipe and makes the fight very easy. It would not damage John Jones' legacy at all. In fact, it will raise it, especially for most of the fans that would watch the fight. John Jones is one of the biggest stars in the sport. He brings in a lot of fans. And if most of those fans see John Jones destroy Stipe, it would only make his legacy greater. Even with the actual facts of the matter that Stipe is not the same guy anymore. By the time they fight each other, it might be four years off for Stipe coming off a knockout loss. I mean, the last time he walked into the arena, do you guys remember seeing him while he was like limping and stuff? I don't know if it's an injury or is him just being older and his body's breaking down. Those can coincide. You know, the injuries that he has is probably has something to do with his age. The whole thing about him having Stipe on his record, the name is big. Greatest heavyweight of all time, Stipe Miocic, is the guy that I beat. But at what point did you beat him? That's like saying Jared Kananir beat Anderson Silva. Because he did. He beat the greatest middleweight of all time. He's the main man of the middleweight division's history. Nobody holds it to that high regard, but, but it wasn't a title fight right? Slap on a title and you bring on a different dynamic that can change the narrative. Even though it's kind of the same thing with or without the belt. Stipe's not in his prime. He's an older guy. He got knocked on his last fight almost three years ago, right? This guy's been a full-time firefighter. He's going to come back and fight John Jones for the belt? Here's the thing. Imagine this now. Imagine Stipe fought Alexander Volkov, right? And let's say Alexander Volkov knocks him out in a non-title fight. Would people hold that win as highly is if John Jones beat him in a title fight? That's my big question. Because I think nobody would. Even though it's the same Stipe, same exact Stipe that John Jones will fight, 
But Volkov knocks him out in a non-title fight. Nobody would hold that win at the same kind of respect than Jones beating him in a title fight. That's right there is how you know. Because not only would Jones beat Stipe right now, a lot of these guys would probably beat Stipe right now. Curtis Blades would probably beat him right now. Tom Aspinall would absolutely beat him right now. Heck, even Surreal Gone might be able to beat him right now. Even in a stylistic uphill battle. But because it's John Jones on a title fight, it's different when it's actually not. It's the same exact Stipe if Volkov fought him right now in a non-title fight, if Curtis Blades fought him in a non-title fight, if Almeida fought him in a non-title fight. It's the same exact guy. But if those fighters beat him, nobody would say this, right? Nobody would say, oh, they beat the greatest heavyweight of all time like they will with John Jones. Isn't that crazy? So yes, the name being on Jones' record is great, but knowing the circumstances, it really isn't. It's like beating Anderson Silva when he's out of his prime, or beating GSP out of his prime, or like Chuck Liddell. It's not the same thing. It doesn't hit as good. And the hardcore fans absolutely understand this, but I think the casual fans would eat it up that, oh, Jones just beat the greatest heavyweight of all time, not knowing that Stipe is way over the hill. And not only is it unfair to Aspinall, it's completely unfair to the whole division. The guy's holding the undisputed title. He is injured, which I understand, but what happened with Jamal Hill and Nir Prohaska when they got injured? They vacated it. And everybody respects him for it. But it is a selfish sport, right? Why would he vacate it when he could just hold on to it? He knows that he's going to fight Stipe. He knows he's going to make a lot of money out of that fight. Why? Why risk the title? Why take away the title and risk higher pay, right? Why would John Jones do that in a selfish sport? Even with that in mind, it is absolutely unfair to all the other fighters. So you either like it for John Jones or you like it for the other fighters. So in a way, you're either siding with John Jones here or you're siding with the whole heavyweight division right? Which side do you take there? They're with the bros dead. If Benoit beats Poirier, where does Poirier go from there? I can see a few different career trajectories for him, but we'd like to hear you break it down. Keep up the great work. Thank you so much, man. If Poirier loses to Benoit Saint-Denis, his title aspirations are over and he should chase the money fights. Go up and fight Colby Covington. Go up and fight Conor McGregor. The guy's a veteran in the game. He has so much experience. He was the interim champ. He got closer than most would to an undisputed title. And he has to accept at that point that, you know, it's just the money fights at this point. It's just the big fights that get the, the fans excited and himself excited. I hope he wouldn't be like a Tony Ferguson. You know, he sticks around way too long and just gets beat by everybody. That would be the worst. So instead of going that direction, which Tony could have done as well. Tony, after losing to, I would say, Benil Dariush, should have just been targeting money fights. No more championship fights. No more contenders. Go for the big fights. Go for Conor McGregor. Fight at welterweight against some other big name. You know, anybody that'll bring eyes to the fight and aren't necessarily the top echelon contenders and champions. Dustin should go that route, especially if he loses the Benoit. Because the risk here of taking the Benoit fight is if Pori loses, he lost to the, what, the number 12 guy? He'll be knocked so far down in the rankings, most likely. There's probably no way to build up again at his age to go and fight for a belt. So I think he should fight like a Colby Covington or something and bring this whole big fight together to get the fans excited. But the guy's doing very well outside the octagon as well. So he has businesses and he doesn't have to go for the money fights. But that would be the big thing for him. Then with the Levi. Oh, you just reminded me of Attack on Titan's ending. I didn't really like it too much. But a lot of people do seem to like it a lot more than the manga. But you have three questions here. So number one, what's the biggest animal you can beat with your bare hands? Oh, now we're getting to the real questions. An average person can most likely beat a coyote, which weighs around like 30 to 40 pounds or something. It might sound crazy, but I believe an average athletic fit person can beat a cheetah in a fight, in an enclosed space, not uh, in the wild. Because when you bring in hunting tactics and sneaking in the grass and stuff like that, it could be pretty difficult to fight off a cheetah who can attack by surprise. But in a fair fight, no weapons, nothing, I think a human could beat a cheetah, but will get severely damaged for sure. Uh, a lot of people don't know this, but cheetah's claws are actually not as sharp. Their claws are usually more blunt, and their bones are light as well. They can't retract their claws, which is very different than the other felines. They could still cause a lot of damage with those, but they're not going to be as dangerous with their claws as other cats. And so if a cheetah's attacking you, and you can avoid their bite, try to get them in a choke, I think a human can absolutely win that. So even though we hear about cheetahs, you know, they're very fast and they're great hunters and stuff like that. In a one-on-one -on -one fight with a human, I think a fit human, a fit athletic human can beat a cheetah. Your second question, how many fourth graders can you beat in a fight at once with no weapons? Uh, maybe like 10, maybe more. I'd be punting them like footballs. And then your third question, you think Hamza can beat a wolf or Habib can beat an eagle? I think Hamza could beat a wolf and I think Habib could beat it. Well, with an eagle, how do you even fight it? You have to wait for it to come down, right? And eagles are huge, actually. But Habib will like grab those wings and just tear it apart if he wanted to.
Then we go to the worst box. Who do you think are the toughest contenders for each current UFC champion? For John Jones, it's Tom Aspinall. For Tom Aspinall, it's Curtis Blades. For Alex Pereira, it's Magomed Ankalaev. For Sean Strickland, it's probably Hamzat. For Leon Edwards, it's Shavkat. For Islam, I would say it's Charles Oliveira. For Volkanovski, it's Ilya Tapuria. For Sean O'Malley, it's absolutely Marab Davalashvili. And for Pantoja, I think it's Brendan Moreno. Honestly, when you really think about Pantoja fighting these other contenders, it's really hard to see anybody beat this guy. I mean, I think about all the other champions and how long they can reign, and I look at Pantoja. Yo, Pantoja probably has the best chance of a long championship reign than any of these other champions right now. He's already beaten so many of the contenders. He beat Manel Kep. He beat Brennan Moreno three times. He beat Brennan Roy Vell twice. There's going to be a lot of rematches for this guy. Then we go to the Renegade Moose. With Eljo saying the Sean fight wasn't his biggest payday and seeing how stacked UFC 299 is, do you think it's possible Sean isn't as big of a draw pay-per-view wise? Yeah. Uh, I think Eljo may kind of confirmed it because I don't think he would lie about it. He took part of that championship fight. He knows what he earned. He got pay-per-view points for it. O'Malley's still like somewhat of a star compared to the other champions right now. Like I can imagine he's bigger than some of the other champions for sure. Now the argument that they're stacking to 299 in order to increase O'Malley's potential star power. But here's the thing a lot of people have to understand about stacking cards for pay-per-view sales. This is the honest truth. Most of the fighters, the casuals do not know or care about. It is what it is. For us who are familiar with way more fighters than just the big superstars and the champions, it's different for us, right? We look at a card with Jack Della Maddalena on it, Gilbert Burns, Michael Page, Kevin Holland, Curtis Blades, Jelton Almeida, Matush Gamma, Hafa Dos Anjos, Pietro Yan, Song Yudong. When we see these names, we think it's super stacked, right? But then look at through the casual fans' perspective. Who do they know on this card? Sean O'Malley, Cheeto. Oh yeah, they fought each other before. And we know that the UFC is going to play that promo with Cheeto beating him and O'Malley trying to get his revenge. So it's going to build into the whole dynamic. So they know Sean O'Malley versus Cheeto. Then they know Dustin. They've heard of RDA, was supposed to fight Conor McGregor before. And that's pretty much it. For the casual fans, it's not as stacked as we like to think it is. Because the casual fans are part of the big pay-per-view sales. Not necessarily the hardcore fans. The hardcore fans fill up like anywhere from two to 400,000, I would say. I think if you're getting to 400,000, you're somewhat crossing it to the casual fans. I think two to 300 is more where the hardcore fans are just buying the pay-per-views. When you're trying to target 500,000 plus, like you're really targeting only the casual fans at that point. The fact they have Dustin and Sean O'Malley, I think that's gonna be like 99% of the pay-per-view sales are from those two guys. Sean O'Malley is known somewhat. Dustin is absolutely known. They're gonna be the two guys that sell this pay-per-view. Unfortunately, not Curtis Blades. Unfortunately, not Jelton Almeida, not Matush Gamrot, not Gilbert Burns, not Piotr Jan. I mean, they probably heard of Piotr Jan. I think the casual fans know Piotr Jan as the Russian guy who got DQ'd where he, where he was winning the fight. Because remember what card that was. That was on UFC 259. That was headlined by Jan Blahovich and Israel Adesanya. Piotr Jan versus Eljamain Sterling was a third title fight. And we know that card sold 800,000 buys, which is absolutely into the casual sphere. Like 100%. Once you get 800,000, so many of the casual fans bought it. It was Adesanya's biggest pay-per-view event. And that's where Piotr Jan got DQ'd against Eljamain Sterling, right? So the casual fans, they know Sean O'Malley. They know Dustin Poirier. They've heard of RDA in the past. He was supposed to fight Connor. He was the guy that pulled out with the foot injury. And then they know Piotr Jan for the guy who got DQ'd. They're going to Jim Irwin. What do you believe is the most underrated aspect or skill in MMA that fighters and fans often overlook and how do you think it impacts the dynamics of a fight who would win if they were the same size Sean Strickland or Sean O'Malley what is the most underrated aspect or skill in MMA that fighters and fans often overlook this might be taekwondo bias but I think a sidekick is very underrated it's such a great technique man it's so good and so easy to learn especially with the game being so meta with fainting I mean, right now would be probably the best time for stuff like sidekicks. There's so many different kind of chambers and feints you could use sidekicks with to set up other things as well. The chambering of the sidekick can mask up a lot of different angles for kicks. And you know the shift knee feint that Sean Strickland and Malcolm and Uncle Live are using? That can also be used to throw out a sidekick or conditioned off a sidekick in order to just pressure off of it right? If a guy who is very good at throwing rear leg sidekicks like Rose does, they can use this shift knee feint in order to just put pressure onto the opponent. The sidekick to the leg is used a lot, but I think to the body and to the head should be used a lot more. And when you mix up all three different targets, instead of just focusing only on the legs, it opens so many things up for you. And it's a rather safe kick to throw and it's very, very fast. It's a good measuring stick to use. And also, 
the high elbow guillotine. We've seen it many, many times, which I don't like personally as much. I think it's much better to gain control of some kind of position or look to reverse the opponent, but to lock in a submission win with a guillotine, the high elbow is the best in my opinion. The arm and guillotine is used so much more though. And who would win if they're the same size? Sean Strickland or Sean O'Malley? Absolutely Sean O'Malley. Most bantamweights will. I mean, when we're talking about like size parity, the smaller guys are usually more technical. And then last question, we're going to go to Japupi Booby. Who do you think are the most underappreciated or forgotten past champions slash contenders in the history of each division? My picks would be 125, Kyoji Horaguchi, 135, Hafal Sansao, 45, Ricardo Lamas, 55, Bendo or Gray Maynard, 70, Carl's Condit, 85, Luke Rockhold, 205, Ricardo Arona, and heavyweight Fabrizio Verdum. That's a good list. Huge respect on Kyoji Horaguchi and Bendo. So I would say at 125, Joseph Benavidez. He's not forgotten, but he's very underappreciated, where people don't even think he's that good. Benavidez in his prime was insanely good. He's absolutely one of the best fighters to never win the UFC title. But I like the Kyoji Horiguchi pick as well. He's a lot more forgotten than underappreciated. For 135, I would say Miguel Torres. Especially for today, a lot of uh, a lot of the newer fans don't know anything about him. He was such a good fighter. He was like 37-1. and one. By the time he lost to Brian Bowles, he was the WEC bantamweight champion. He defended it a few times and then lost to Brian Bowles and Joseph Benavidez. And he didn't do as well in the UFC. For 145, I actually will go with your pick as well, Ricardo Lamas. In his prime, that guy was very good. I still remember in the fifth round with Jose Aldo where he finally was having success against him as Aldo slowed down. Because Aldo was beating up that leg. He was hitting him a lot with that left hook, right leg kick combo. Just beautiful work from Jose Aldo, and Ricardo Lamas showed his toughness throughout the fight. Eventually, as Aldo slowed down, Ricardo Lamas was able to get on top of him and finally land some of that signature ground and pound he was known for. 155, Bendo, and I'll also say TJ Grant. Gray Maynard is a good pick as well. With 170, I think Carlos Condit is like the right pick to make because like a lot of the other fighters that fought Carlos Condit, like GSP, Robbie Lawler, Nick Diaz, even Roy McDonald. All of these guys get recognized. Even Roy McDonald, who never won the belt in the UFC and wasn't necessarily like a big superstar or something, he gets recognized more than Carlos Condit. Carlos Condit was the interim champ. He has that knockout win over Roy McDonald. He had an absolute war with Robbie Lawler. But for some reason, only now it looks like he doesn't get recognized as much. Back then, when he was active in his prime, Everybody loved Carl's Condit. Everybody used to talk about him. But now actually thinking about it, it feels strange we don't hear about him anymore. I think it probably has to do with the amount of times he lost in modern MMA, you know, against Damian Maya and Neil Magny and Michael Kies and other fighters. Like the newer fans, their memory of Carl's Condit is just him losing a lot. And it's probably why he doesn't get recognized or appreciated as much as like Nick Diaz or GSP or Robbie Lawler or Roy McDonald, where those guys were either superstars or or they finished their careers with major success. For 185, you could say both Luke Rockhold and Chris Wyman. I'll also throw in Gegard Musasi. Gegard Musasi is so good, man. But it doesn't get talked about as much as some of the others. For 205, I'd probably say Tito Ortiz. Tito Ortiz was very good in his prime. But these days, he's just looked at as like a meme or a joke. But people forget how great he was, man. Back in the early and mid-2000s, he was beating a lot of guys out there. Like Vanderlei, Vitor... Forrest Griffin, he defended his belt like five times or whatever it was. And then for the heavyweight division, I would say Merkel Krokop or Big Nog. These two around the same time, them and Fedor were the heavyweights to talk about back in Pride. They were regarded as the best heavyweights on the planet, not only in Pride. And they had legendary fights against each other. But when people look at the greatest heavyweights of all time and they look at like the greatest talents for each era, you don't see a lot of Big Nog, you don't see a lot of Merkel Krokop these days. You do see Fedor, of course, but the other two are not talked about as much. And I think it's because Fedor beat both of them. But number two and number three behind Fedor during that time still puts you at legendary status. And that's ultimately the end of the episode, guys. Great questions. No history segment, as I do have the podcast, the history podcast episode already up. That's going to be in the description. So make sure if you guys want to hear any history stuff, I do have a very good guest. He knows a lot. We have a lot of fun talking about historical figures and battles and just the good, fun, meaty stuff of history that we have a lot of passion for. So I hope you guys subscribe to the channel. Hope you guys like some of that content if you're into the history stuff. And if not, maybe just give it a listen, give it a try, play in the background. We usually get into the fun, interesting stuff throughout history. So I hope you guys enjoyed this podcast. And if you did, make sure to give it a like, make sure to subscribe, hit the bell for notifications, and I'll see you guys in the next video.